Good evening and welcome. I am Dr. Lindsay Hayes, a postdoctoral management program fellow here at NASA headquarters. Tonight's event, Ancient Earth, Alien Earths, is a panel discussion about what we know about the early Earth and how that can guide our search for habitable planets orbiting other stars. It will be followed by a question and answer period with those of you here in the audience, as well as on social media using hashtag AskNASA. This is the public portion of a two-part workshop that is happening this week, supported by NASA, the Ninth National Science Foundation, and the Smithsonian Institute, focusing on the habitability of the early Earth. I have the pleasure of being one of the co-organizers of this workshop, as well as of tonight's event. I will rejoin you all for the question and answer period, but until then, I would like to introduce our moderator for this evening, Dr. David Grinspoon, a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, as well as the, inaugur the inaugural Bloomberg NASA Chair in Astrobiology at the Kluge Center of the Library of Congress. David? Thank you, Lindsay. And thank you all for coming out this afternoon. And a big hello to all you people out there in NASA TV land. I'm thrilled to be here to present to you this discussion of some really exciting new science. We live in a revolutionary time in terms of our knowledge of the universe. This is the time of the exoplanet revolution. We now know that most stars out there have planetary systems of their own. We didn't know this until recently. It's a big discovery. And we're also in a time of rapid discovery about the history of life on Earth and the origin and early evolution of life on Earth. And we're here this afternoon to try to bring all that together. I've got a panel of experts here who all are doing research that chips away at that problem of life elsewhere and how we can apply our knowledge of Earth history to the question of life elsewhere. So let me now introduce the panelists to you. And let me say that if I were going to give them all the full introduction they would deserve, it would take the full hour. They're all very accomplished people. And all the lists of awards and degrees and publications would fill an encyclopedia. But instead, I'm going to give a very brief introduction because I want you to hear what they have to say. So briefly, starting over here on my far right, we have Chris House. Chris is the director of the Penn State Astrobiology Research Center. And his research fo focuses on microbial geochemical signatures of life. And what that means is that he studies the tiniest organisms there are and looks at how they interact with their, how they affect their environments and studies the, and applies that to the question of how can we use these clues to understand the origin and early evolution of life here and elsewhere in the universe. Next to Chris is Dr. Phoebe Cohen. Phoebe's a professor of geosciences at Williams College. And her research focuses on larger organisms, the fossil record, the evolution of complexity. She looks at the interactions between Earth and life in deep time, and in, in particular, the origin of animals and the origin of complexity on Earth, and again, the question of where complex, might ar complex life might arise in the universe. Over here, to my left, Tim Lyons is a professor of biogeochemistry at the Department of Earth Sciences at University of California in Riverside. Tim studies the evolution of the ocean, of the atmosphere, and of life, and how these are all coupled together, how they affect one another. He looks at the chemistry of the modern ocean and asks, how can this help us to understand ancient oceans and the atmosphere and the search for extraterrestrial life? Next, we have Dr. Don Sumner. Don is a professor of geology at University of California, Davis. She studies the early environment of Earth and the early environment of Mars and the evolution of bacteria on Earth and potentially on Mars and other environments. And this research has taken her from Antarctica to the surface of Mars, where she's one of the, uh, one of the main scientists working on a large team of scientists running the Curiosity rover and trying to understand what that environment of Gal Crater is telling us about Mars and about life in the universe. Finally, we have Dr. Sean Damagal goldman Sean is a research space scientist at Goddard Space Flight Center for NASA. And Sean studies the interaction of life and planets. And in particular, thinks about the signatures of life, the biosignatures, how we would detect life on another planet, and how we can use that to trace life's origins and evolution. And lately, he's been designing telescopes. 
new, a new generation of telescopes that we hope to use to find these biosignatures on some of these exoplanets that we've been discovering. So now you know who these fine people are, and now I want to get them talking. So I'm going to start off by pitching a, uh, well, I don't know if it's a softball question or not, but I'm going to ask you each to respond to a question about life's inevitability. We talk a lot, we hear a lot about this Goldilocks zone, this notion that the, the, the jackpot for searching for planets elsewhere is to find a planet in the zone where it would have liquid water on the surface. And what I want to know from all of you who've studied different aspects of this problem is, if we, if we find such a planet, does that mean it should have life? In other words, is water itself a sort of biosignature? Or as one of the, my colleagues said in the workshop this afternoon, he said, if you have a water world, how do you keep it dead? <laughs> well, thanks, David. Uh, that's definitely not a softball question. <laughs> I, um, I, I'll start by saying it, you know, it's really profound, and, and it, you know, whether it dictates whether or not life is, is common or rare, and, and either uh, result would be totally profound for our place in the cosmos, so certainly not a softball. Um, I also say that my own personal opinion on this uh, has changed. Uh, or, you know, I, early on in my career, um, like many of my colleagues, I was actually quite optimistic that you know, whenever you have what liquid water, you form um, the necessary uh, materials for life, and therefore you, then you end up forming the necessary, uh, you, you end up forming life. Uh, but no, lately I've actually um, started to, to really be open to the idea that we, we, we need to consider the, the reverse possibility, that we, what we have here is quite special and quite unique, which is also really profound. Um, and that, um, you know, basically a lot of people's feeling on this, or we'll probably, I'd like to hear what my colleagues have to say, but a lot of people's feeling on this is driven by the fact that we see um, life goes back to the really very beginnings of Earth. And so that implies a quick origin. Um, but there's other things, other uh, pieces of evidence we have out there that, that, you all, that also uh, bear on the question. Uh, for example, when you look at meteorites, we know that, uh, that, that a lot of water was rushing through many of these early planetesimals in the solar system. And there was energy gradients. Um, and they formed a lot of organic matter. And so that, that can be taken as a very really optimistic view. You're starting to get life going. But you can also conclude that those, those bodies in the solar system then didn't form a biosphere. Those, the, the distribution of organics don't imply that they had cells and metabolism. Um, and so we had places in the solar system where, light, where water was rushing through and energy was there, um, but we only seem to, at least presently, have evidence for life here, uh, one, one origin for our solar system. Of course, that could change as we study Mars, and that's, that's going to be exciting to see how that plays out. So you think the, jur the jury's out? The jury's out, but I think not, not only I, I think I'm uh, I'm very open to the idea that 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 what we have is very special here. Wow, Phoebe, do you have a thought? Um, well, that was a hard act to follow. That was a really great answer, but I think that I will add that you can't just have liquid water. You have to have liquid water for an extended period of time, and as Chris alluded to, you also need other conditions in order for life to evolve. So probably some sort of stability over some sort of time scale that we don't really have a handle on yet where liquid water is existing um, in an environment that is permissive for life. So I would say that you need water plus a bunch of other things. And what those things are, I don't think we really have a good handle on right now. Uh, what do you think? Well, I would agree that the jury's out. I think it's the right place to start. Um, but I, I'm drawn to the backdrop behind us. And when I was a kid and I started all of this, the v visions of the early Earth were something very different than this. But now we see water in volcanoes. and. There are new data that suggest that water may have been on our planet more than four billion years ago. Um, the evidence for life um, is, is quite a bit younger than that. Suggestions at 3.7, 3.8 billion years ago, more convincing evidence at 3.5. So that's a lot of time between evidence for water and life. And we don't really know what happened during that time interval. And we don't know that that would be inevitable and that it would play out the same way every place we look. Wow, you're all such, so, so cautious. You sound like scientists. What? <laughs> Dawn, what's your thought? Uh, I uh, don't have a personal opinion. I shift around back and forth all the time. But one of the most exciting things to me is that we actually have two rovers on Mars and orbiters around Mars that are telling us there was an extensive history of liquid water on early Mars. And we have instrumentation 
that with the Curiosity rover has demonstrated that we had liquid water uh, interactions between the water and the rock, which gives an energy gradient and the elements that are necessary for life. We have not found evidence of life. Um, when we look at rock, Earth's fossil record, it's very difficult to find that evidence even though we know life was present. Um, and, and it's this whole process of discovery and investigation. So, you know, I, as an individual, I want to have an opinion, but then I, as a scientist, I'm in this wonderful place where we can actually ask those questions with the missions that we have now on Mars and the Mars 2020 rover that's being planned is, is, is the next step to do a little bit better scientific investigations. We have the conditions that show liquid water was present, and many of us think for a, a long time. Um, and now it's a question of whether or not we can find evidence of life if it, if it was there. Great. Sean? So I, I agree with Don. You know, I, uh, to me, and I flipped that around from the question to a statement. <clears throat> every planet that has had water has had life, or every planet that has water has life. Not as something I necessarily believe, but as a hypothesis that we can test with the rigors of the scientific method and with the spacecraft that we deliver to Mars. We also know of water throughout the outer solar system on many of the moons out there. Europa and Enceladus are probably the two well, uh, most well known. And for exoplanets, we're finding these planets in that happy zone, in the Goldilocks zone, where the conditions could allow for liquid water. And we want to build a telescope to then look for signs of life on those planets to test this as a hypothesis. And, in, and this is what's really great to me is, you know, we could have pondered this as natural philosophers 500 or 1,000 years ago. And either we're the first generation or our kids are the first generation that's going to be able to rigorously test this as scientists and not just as, you know, philosophers kind of pondering about it. <laughs> and I, to me, that's, that's what keeps me working late at night and waking up early. Well, my baby wakes me up early in the morning, but <laughs> I stay up late at night working on this stuff for that reason. You must not get much sleep. <laughs> so, uh, so it seems like the, the, the sense of the jury is that if we find a water world, it's, uh, it's exciting but doesn't necessarily tell us for sure that we've found life. But as Don said, in a certain sense, on Mars we found a water world, or we believe it was, at one, we have good evidence that it was at one time a water world. So then Mars perhaps becomes an important test. If it was a water world and this idea of inevitability is right, then we should be able to find the life there. Except, as you also said, it's very hard to find life in ancient rocks. And that leads to the next question I want to ask all of you, which is about signs of life in ancient rocks or ancient tracers of life on Earth. When do, and this is a question for, for any of you to answer, and maybe all of you if you want to chime in, but when do you think is the first really good evidence um, of, and, and what is that evidence, and how, what, when does it date to of life on the planet Earth? Um, anybody want to jump in, or should I? Tim, you mentioned. Yeah, yeah, Tim, well, I, 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 yeah I alluded to that. Um, and. You know, it's, it's an ongoing story, of course, like all of these things. Um, there are many people in the community that accept um, geochemical evidence for early life. And I have to mention the I word, isotopes, which is always very difficult <laughs> to do. But, but they're not fossils. Um, they're not well-preserved organic molecules. They're not something that most people would point out and say there's life. But there are signatures within the geochemistry that suggest metabolic processes, and, and those date somewhat convincingly to 3.7 billion years ago. Some would push that a little bit further back. Um, by the time we get to 3.5 million years ago, we have things that are called stromatolites, something that Dawn works on quite a bit, and others, um, that are microbial mats. Um, they're a, a sedimentary organic structure where material is trapped, but meant to be trapped by an organic film. And there are also microfossils that I think most people at this point accept. Um, and so the first fossil evidence, putative fossil evidence, is about three and a half billion years ago. Um, there has historically been a record about 2.7 billion years ago of organic molecules that um, suggest a particular kind of process, and an important one, the production of oxygen. But in recent years, in the past year or so, that's been challenged by the collection of new materials and a more sophisticated level of an analysis. So um, I, I'm comfortable pushing things back to three and a half billion years ago, maybe even further back than that. Um, but things start to become certainly more convincing as we get younger. I think something that's really interesting too is when you look at, at especially the three and a half billion year old um, rocks that we have, 
it's not just um, one type of life. You know, you see evidence for, for a number of different types of metabolisms. Uh, we don't yet know about oxygenic photosynthesis, where you're producing oxygen, but other types of photosynthesis, um, sulfate reduction, met uh, methanogenesis. And, and so um, the fact that it's not just the fact that life was present at three and a half, but that there is a lot of different types of life by that point, at, at least that's my, my opinion of when I look at the record. Which suggests that a, li a lot might be going on, have gone on before that. Right. You have, right. You have an ecology that's established right. and it's being, and it varies with the environment that the organisms are growing in. Mm -hmm. and right, that, so there's the earliest solid evidence and there's the, when life actually started. And what you're saying is that you're seeing that solid evidence of sophisticated life that presumably had some long history before it. Right, and so it's much easier to find good evidence for life that's forming a whole ecology because then you start to accumulate the signatures and they're easier to preserve in the rock record. If you have one or two cells reacting with a mineral in a, a little environment, it's very, very hard to see. And so the first good evidence of life is likely, there has to be quite a bit of evolution bef um, between the time when you first get life and, and you have something that's reasonable to preserve in the rock record. This is something you were asking us about earlier, like the difference between the origin of life versus the origin of like a biosphere where the life has its foothold on the planet. And I think that's, that's sort of what we're talking about. And right. we also have to deal with the fact that we only have so many rocks from that time period, and most of them aren't very well preserved. So we're more likely to find signatures of life when it's very widespread, um, because we're only able to sample tiny little pieces of that original Archean world. Well, do you think if we go to the moon, we could find old earth rocks that would, would give us that answer? That's an interesting question. <laughs> I'm not sure. When, one of the reasons to explore Mars is because it, it doesn't have the plate tectonics. The, the, you know, on Earth, the rocks are heated up and destroyed, but most of the surface of Mars is three billion years old and older. And so it gives us a chance to look at very old rocks in the solar system. We have, we have a whole different set of questions, but Mars has a big suite of these early rocks to investigate. And the simple answer to your question, David, is there is definitely Earth material on the moon. I mean, getting to it would be very difficult, but, but it's definitely, it should be there. So it somewhere, be a lot of material somewhere on the moon from, there's that sample of there Earth should that's be got those <laughs> earliest quite a lot of life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and just the, the other reason we think about this uh, from NASA's perspective is the earlier life evolved, the implication is that the more easy it was for life to evolve in a general sense. And so the more likely it would be that life is, uh, is out there elsewhere. Um, and, and the other reason is it teaches us how to look for life. Because when we're looking in the earliest parts of, of Earth's rock record for signs of life, we're learning lessons about how to look for life, period. That, right. that could be applicable to Mars. We'll talk later on about how it could also be applicable to exoplanets. And, and as we learn more about the Earth, one of the great dilemmas was reconciling these, these data that go back to maybe 3.8 billion years ago um, suggests this, some kind of carbon fixation. So something like photosynthesis, which is a fairly advanced pathway. And that was always very difficult to reconcile with this notion of very heavy bombardment by extraterrestrial materials just before that in a world that we imagine that didn't look like this, that didn't have water. And so now that we're able to push water back and in this workshop that Lindsay alluded to, um, that idea of this heavy bombardment just before the evidence for life is being questioned. And so that earlier Earth looks a little bit better to get us where we may have been at 3.7 or 3.5 billion years ago. But at some point, certainly things were being pummeled at such a pace that you probably wouldn't have wanted to hang out there, right? Yeah, it's a question of how intense, how often, and, and life is very resilient. And so, again, we discussed about the, the possibility of refugia, places deep within the Earth where life could survive and pop its head back out. And we know that happens today. Life extends very deep within the, within the subsurface. Interesting. Okay, well, speaking of the early Earth and then thinking a bit more about all those exoplanets out there, I want to ask a question about, uh, about biosignatures. When we talk mostly about finding life on exoplanets, we think about finding Earth out there, and maybe we'd find some oxygen or methane or other signs that, of a planet that's like our Earth today. But what I'm hearing from you guys is that life has a long history and that the Earth has changed radically during the time that Earth has been an inhabited planet. So the question is, if we detected a planet out there that was like the, the Earth in, in the Archean, say, say three billion years ago, would we recognize it as an inhabited planet? What are the biosignatures of ancient Earth 
and how would they differ from the biosignatures today? And I might let Sean yeah. start off with that. One. So maybe can I start with the biosignatures of, of modern Earth from, from a telescope? So if you're, if you're looking at modern Earth with a telescope, the, the indicator that we're inhabited would be the, the simultaneous presence of oxygen and methane. I, I say they're, that they're like college students in pizza. They consume each other. The college students consume the pizza, and the pizza's gone. And so if you find pizza in a room full of college students, you know someone just delivered that pizza. Well, with oxygen and methane, they, they destroy each other as well. And so, you know, if they're both there together, you know someone is bringing the methane in, in an atmosphere rich in oxygen. Uh, and, and so that's what you're looking for. And the, the most likely explanation is it's the life that's bringing the methane and the oxygen to the party. Um, for the case of Archean Earth, we would not have had oxygen. Uh, it, you know, there was, if you went there in a time machine or DeLorean or whatever, and you stepped out and you didn't have a gas mask on, you'd suffocate, even though there was an atmosphere there, because there would have been no oxygen to breathe. And that's the gas we want to look for. Uh, for, for signs of life on other planets. So what would we look for? Um, I was actually thinking about this question as a graduate student at Penn State, where, where Chris House is a professor, and, and at the time was a professor. And I was in an office down the hall, across the hall from his lab, and there were these awful, <laughs> awful smells coming out of his lab <laughs> every day. And, and not I, every day. Not every day. <laughs> It was the pizza. And, and it, uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't his students and it wasn't the pizza. It was, it was microbes that Chris was growing in the lab, or his, his students were. And I asked, well, you know, what's going on here? And he said, well, they were growing these, well, may, I mean, you can maybe give more details on the experiment, but they were growing microbes in these anoxic, these oxygen-free conditions similar to early Earth, and they were making these other gases. And so that kind of kicked off an idea of, well, well are these, would these gases be detectable remotely? They're kind of uh, sulfur methyl gases is probably the easiest way to explain it. It's like a sulfur atom with the rest of a methane uh, molecule stitched onto it. Uh, they don't last long in modern day Earth's environment because they get oxidized, but if you went back to the Archean or, or any planet without oxygen and you had life making these gases, which they clearly do, I detected them myself, um, then, then they might have built up long enough for us to see with a, with a telescope from far away. Um, and there's lots of caveats to that story. That's kind of the simple version. But, you know, I, I, I joke often that maybe you want to smell for life on other planets instead of look for it with a telescope. So you should invent a, a smelloscope that works at interstellar <laughs> distances. That'd be qu yeah. quite Professor a Professor Farnsworth, we need to yes, <laughs> quite a feat. One interesting thing about that about that particular set of experiments is that, um, and this is, I guess, just a useful lesson for the public, um, is that we weren't. That is not what we were looking for. Yeah. You know, this is one of those cases of. Um, Wasn't what I was looking for either. Right. Well, fair enough. <laughs> Of science, you know, a lot of times scientific discoveries are serendipitous. We, we, our experiment was, was for a different purpose, and uh, in that case, carbon monoxide um, <clears throat> ended up inhibiting one of the enzymes of a, of a certain organism, and so then it had to switch its metabolism to something that was totally unknown at the time. So we, we discovered a, a different way that microbes could get energy uh, completely by mistake, which often happens, you know, and so uh, that's one of the fun things about science is that, you know, often some of our breakthroughs are, are serendipitous and exciting. Sorry. No, go ahead. I, I also wouldn't give up on oxygen. Um, and, and so for those of, those of, those of you who Someone's don't follow speak up this, for oxygen. I mean, there are abiological ways of getting oxygen or producing free O2 that can be released to the atmosphere. But most estimates are that that's not very much and that you really need photosynthesis to do that. And so one of the big questions in studies of the early Earth is when did that start? Um, and, and our opinions on that evolved. But we think, most people that I know, think that that started happening before it started accumulating in the atmosphere. So there's not only this question of when did it begin and is it a viable biosignature, which I think it is, but what is the interaction with the planet, our Earth in our case, of the early Earth, that allowed it to accumulate so that it could be detected from elsewhere. Um, so it, it remains, I think, a primary target as well. I think you would agree with that. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Well, um, now moving a little bit farther forward in the evolution of Earth and possibly of other planets, I want to ask Phoebe about the boring billion. <laughs> there's, in, in our field, there's this, um, you know, slightly sarcastic um, phrase that people use, the boring billion. And remember, a billion years is a long, long time. <laughs> uh, you know, arguably, uh, human civilization is 10,000 years old, and uh, hominid evolution is maybe a million years old. We'll multiply that by a thousand, and you get a billion. That's more than a quarter of the history of the Earth. So, uh, what is the boring billion, and was it really boring? Well, uh, the boring building billion is a time in Earth history, sort of after what we've just talked about, and but before uh, complex life evolved, where it appears as if not very much is happening, and that's from the geological and, and geochemical records. Um, however, 
it's probably not as boring as we think it is, in part because those records aren't very full. So a billion years, like you said, is a huge amount of time, and we haven't sampled that time period very finely. And so we're seeing little pockets of things that sort of look boring. Um, and then from a paleontological perspective, what's really interesting is that I, you know, I study fossils of microscopic organisms that live during this time period, and most of them just look like little beach balls. Um, they have very little shape. There's very little to distinguish them from other little beach balls that I find in a rock. But that doesn't mean that they're not evolving. And so I think one of the really important things to remember is that organisms are always evolving, even if they're not changing their shape or their form. And so this time period that seems evolutionarily uh, or appears in the fossil record to be boring could have been a time of major innovation that we just can't see with the tools that we have right now. So it may just seem boring because we don't know what we're talking about. Right, or we don't know how to look. We don't, <laughs> yeah. know, we don't know how to look or where, or we don't, I think we have some ideas about how to, but we haven't yet looked um, in the right places at the right uh, proxies to get at the interesting bits. Do you mean also mean genetically in terms of what's happening from, yeah. a, from a DNA standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, life is always evolving. We can't, you know, we cannot go back and sequence DNA from a, a two billion year old organism. That's an important thing to remember is that DNA um, decomposes very rapidly. And so, you know, once you move back a few tens of thousands, maybe a hundred thousand years, DNA is pretty useless to you. And so all you have left is the shape of the organism or molecular fossils, which are preserved molecules that organisms make, which may um, help sort of flesh out this boring, boring time <laughs> period. It, and to me, that's one of the really interesting intervals in terms of getting complex life and mm -hmm. whether or not complex life is in, inevitable in evolution. Because um, complex life on Earth is mostly supported by oxygen, and we had oxygen for a long period before we get that, that fossil record. And, and so that even though we don't see too much from it yet, a lot of times when you don't know much about something, that's where future discoveries right. are going to be. Mm -hmm. And we know from what we see before and after that it's really, really important interval. OK, so it may not have been boring. I, I'm, I'm glad to hear that, because that is a long time to be bored. But, uh, but nonetheless, it seems like it did take a long time for complex life to appear on the Earth. And just as we did discuss the inevitability, possible inevitability of life, given the right conditions at first. You've mentioned this question of the inevitability of complexity. Um, what do you guys think about that? Can we say anything based on the terrestrial record of whether, given life on a planet, it would get complex? My feeling is uh, that boring is an unfortunate term. Um, I, there, there was a lot of innovation during that time. That was the time period that set the stage for more complex life, animals in particular. Um, the geochemical record suggests that there was a kind of stasis. Um, the, the traditional views of some of the isotopic records and other things suggest that it was a time of perhaps low and relatively stable low oxygen. And so to me, that's not boring at all. It's remarkable that you could have a billion years of such conditions, if you think about it. Once you have this innovation of oxygen production and you think about all the different reactions, why would it have been so stable? So my research group has been exploring that quite extensively. And one of the feelings that we have is that you have this very long period and that it may have taken something fairly dramatic, either tectonic or climatic, or feedbacks associated with innovation of life that just came from having it for a long time that brought you closer to, to complexity, and it's specifically animals. And so if there were external drivers, um, or even internal drivers within the Earth, like, like te plate tectonics, mountain building activities, um, if that's required, then it seems less than inevitable to me. Yeah, I can imagine a world where life just happily chugs along being microbial Bacteria. for billions of years. Um, I think one of the now interesting that would be boring. No. <laughs> <laughs> but they would be doing cool stuff. You yeah. know, they might be inventing yeah. new metabolisms. Right. They'd still be evolving and changing, even if they yeah. weren't big enough for us to see with our eyes, which, yeah. you know, seems to be our metric for success no, I, in the world. I don't really <laughs> think it would be boring, but I think it would be a shame to have a universe where there wasn't something right. that could. I mean, for instance, yeah. uh, we, we wouldn't be here having this That's conversation true. if that was where life yeah. got stuck I'm, on I'm Earth. glad it happened the way but it did. But a planet did. that that happens for billions of years on might be enough for us to detect it, right? Yeah. Because the bacteria can yeah. do enough to the planet to affect the atmosphere enough for us to detect it. Probably better than more complex life, yeah. right? That's, well, yeah. unless you get super complex. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, you actually mentioned something a couple minutes ago that I want to come back to because it stuck in my mind and it bothered me a little bit. You said that there are 
non-biological ways to make oxygen on the earth. Right. And all this talk about biosignatures and the fact that when we do learn something about exoplanets, it's so hard to learn anything. We're going to have these very limited clues and we have these criterion. How do we know that we're not going to find false positives if oxygen is one of the sort of keys to finding life and there are ways to make oxygen that don't need life? And, and are there other kinds of false, po po false positives? And, and do you guys worry about that? And how do we, how do we guard against that? Any, any thoughts? So the, the, I can take this one. We, we actually just had a paper accepted. It's on archive uh, that will come out in the Astrophysical Journal soon on this. this is, so I talked earlier about you know, how would life how would we look for life on a planet that didn't have the same biosignatures as modern day Earth? And this is the flip side of that. How could a planet make modern day Earth like biosignatures even if it didn't have life? This is the false positive. And, and to answer that, we, I don't know, literally do not know how we would have even started to answer that question if we didn't have some picture like this of what Archean Earth or the early Earth looked like. This, these questions of why did oxygen rise to begin with led a lot of scientists, including some of the people here in the room, to do a lot of work figuring out how to uh, very finely balance redox on a planet, to, to count up all the things that cause a planet to be more oxidized and all the things that cause it to be less oxidized. And when you add all those up, you, and, then, and you know which parts of it biology contributes to, you can take a model with all that stuff in and just plunk the biology out. And then you have a model for a, a non-biological planet. I know, I know, it's yeah, hard, so, right? Right, so the, the converse side of that is the models are built on Earth. Yes, and absolutely. And most of us agree that we had ecosystems three and a half billion years ago, or oldest rocks are four billion years ago, and it's entirely possible that everything, that a large part of what we understand is influenced That's right. by biology. Our models fundamentally are built on, built on a world in which there was right. biology. And we're, we assume that we know the things that biology is contributing well enough to take them back out of the models. Um, and w but once we do that, the, the sort of the end story is there are false positives. Uh, but the way you, you measure or account for them, discriminate between the false positives and the true positives, is you look for something other than just oxygen. That's, this is where methane becomes really important. And, and I think it, it comes down to the, the scientific process as well. As soon as you find something in the real universe that you think might be a biosignature, Right. It, it, there's always the might and there's always the questions and we have a lot of arguments uh, in the community about what different things mean but that's a very productive way you go from a, a possible detection to maybe someday something that most people agree is a, a detection of life elsewhere. Yeah, I mean the, the early earth is unbiased in this but is our great natural lab and so we have rocks and we have fossils in many cases and we can go and look at these and we can start from the assumption that they're not biological fossils it's a little less ambiguous but the geochemistry is often a challenge and we keep testing that and testing that and convince ourselves maybe not by a single line of evidence but a preponderance of evidence and from that we can start to model an atmosphere and that's all you're going to get for a long time from an exoplanet that's right, right? and we can think about how that changes and this is this is something we've also learned from Mars by looking mm -hmm. at past claims of evidence for life on Mars, whether it was the Viking landers, whether it was the Allen Hills meteorite, once community started looking at it and, and really raising the standard of proof for those claims, we realized that it's not just a single line of evidence, it's this totality of a multiple lines of evidence that you really need to take to the problem. We'd like to, t to take that to exoplanets, but every single thing I want to add, every single measurement I want to add to that telescope, um, you know, it adds, it adds cost, it adds complexity to feasibility. the telescope and feasibility to that telescope design. Well, so it's a good thing we have uh, the early Earth because without it we'd be really hosed as far as <laughs> <laughs> ideas about extraterrestrial life. People sometimes say when you tell them you're an astrobiologist, they say, oh, that's the field that doesn't have any data or any evidence. But in reality, we've got tons of data and tons of evidence. We've got the whole history of the Earth and the story of life on Earth and our growing knowledge of environments elsewhere on planets and our solar system and elsewhere. But here's a question for you guys. Is there a danger in being too Earth-centered in our thinking? Since we have this one biosphere and we sort of cling to it as our example of life to extrapolate elsewhere, is there a possibility that we're really wrong about the universals of life, that it doesn't need the kinds of biomolecules that we think, that it doesn't even need to be carbon-based? And if so, do we still have a prospect for finding life? And, and how do we go, how do we even think about that question? Well, Anybody? I think, first of all, you know, I think it's really clear for 
exploration in our own solar system that we absolutely have to be um, open to life that's not like Earth. Um, I mean, that's, you know, and that's because we can look through the solar system and we can, we can certainly see places uh, of interest um, that are worth exploring. You know, certainly the, the biggies often mentioned, Europa, Titan, both of them have, have some parallels to Earth and some aspects that are quite different than Earth. Um, but the list is longer. I mean, Ceres, we're going to, Dawn mission is going to Ceres very soon. That's going to become extremely exciting. And, and, and Ceres is outgassing water to the solar system. So, um, and, and of course, Mars. And so, you know, we have you know, a number of targets, um, and, and if you can also include Ganymede. And all of those are going to require, to some degree, thinking outside the Earth-centric box. And so I think we're all comfortable with that from trying to figure out how a biosphere could operate. But, but it's challenging when you start to then think about the burden proof of, of detecting life and trying to avoid false positives. On Earth, we have the burden of proof of almost trying to figure out if life wasn't there because life has been so pervasive for billions of years. And now we'll have a challenge of having to explore when the presumption has to be uh, the some sort of null hypothesis there isn't life. I think that one of the amazing things about the exoplanet revolution is that it has provided us with sort of creative ideas, right? So you hear about these planets around other stars that look so different than our Earth. I think as a scientist, that's super exciting because you can say, okay, now I have something to work with here. What might life look like on a planet the size of Saturn or, you know, a planet that's much, much closer to its star than Earth? And so in a way, I think that that's helped us move away from an Earth-centric view by providing us with um, opportunities to explore other ways that life could involve on planets that have no similarity or very little similarity to Earth. Yeah, I think with exoplanets, it's really shocked a lot of our models of how planets form and evolve over time in a system of planets. And we haven't made the biological and the chemical measurements for, for, for these planets for the most part yet. When we get those measurements, I expect to be equally surprised. I, I can't wait to be like scratching my head over that, those data and be like, well, how, how, how did that happen? You know, what is life or what is that planet doing? Like, mm -hmm. that, that, that's the moment I'm waiting for. Yeah, it's, uh, it's going to be an exciting uh, next uh, decade or two as we start to actually learn something about these, these exoplanets and explore the solar system further. Well, I think at this point we want to get your opinions and your questions. So I, 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 we could keep discussing amongst ourselves for a long time. I, we could clearly go on for hours. But at this point, I think it would be great to see if, uh, if there are any questions from the audience and, and online. And so I'm going to turn it back over to Lindsay now, who will run the uh, question and answer portion. Thanks, David. Um, I see we have a few questions here in the audience, but I just will get to those in one moment. Um, I'd just like to remind those of you uh, watching and those following us on social media to use hashtag AskNASA. Uh, we'll be looking for some questions from you guys as well. So if you'd like to go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you. That was great. But um, So I'm going to operate under the optimistic philosophy that we will make this discovery at least sometime in my lifetime, hopefully. But so when we make this discovery and, you know, we decide that, you know, there is enough evidence to prove, you know, the biosignatures tell us there's enough evidence to prove that there is life on an exoplanet, potentially. Um, besides, obviously, sc further scrutiny of that data, um, you know, and of course, I would expect that and I would hope that there's people who, you know, disagree, but what comes next? Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, great question. I mean, ch chances are, that discovery is not going to come just in a moment because it, it, it's often a gradual process where you discover something intriguing and then you study it more and you do more observations. So it might not actually be an aha, but a, an extended, hey, let's, let's pay more attention to this one and sort of a gradual dawning of appreciation. But, but what comes next is very tricky. I don't know, do, do any of you uh, have, uh, have thoughts for, on that? What's, what's the next step? Well, or, it, celebration. It <laughs> yeah, exactly. For, yeah, first we're going to celebrate, at least for a yeah. night, right? Yeah, party. Just one night. We'll Just party. One night. But, but then, you know, we're going to have all kinds of questions about what is happening to that planet over time, right? Does that planet have seasons? And if it has seasons, you know, are there, is the life responding to the seasonal cycles uh, in that planet's orbit? What's happening over the decades? Is, it, is that planet evolving or the, the atmosphere of that planet evolving? What's happening to the carbon dioxide signal over time? Things like that are what we want, are going to want to look at. Um, if, if we really want to know more about that planet, and we, you know, we see the, well, all we're going to get at first are these sort of spectral signatures, these like dips in the spectrum from oxygen and methane or some similar pair. 
if we really want to know more about that planet, I, I've heard some far off ideas of putting a fleet of telescopes out there that when they act together could actually get you a, a map of the surface of the planet. And you could start to map out where the continents and oceans are. Uh, if the forests are big enough where they could have a color signature and you can see our forests from space, you could start to look for that sort of thing too. If you want to think really far out there to like our grandkids missions, that's, that's where you'd be thinking. Someone's going to want to send a, a, a flyby eventually, but I'm not that, eventually, I'm not that patient. Yeah. Yeah. And another point is that you know, it, we, we keep talking about that one. Really, we're talking yeah. about a population. We'll want to see. Yeah, know, that's I mean, right. we'll, be, we'll celebrate every single time <laughs> this happens. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but let's hope it's dozens, um, you know, dozens of, of discoveries. But you know, it's my view that once the exoplanet revolution really sinks in and the people get it about what we're discovering, that there, there will be public support to fund the kind of instruments that Sean is exploring, trying to build to learn more about these exoplanets. And once that discovery that you're mentioning gets made and we say, aha, we've got a live one, then I think there'll be public support maybe to build that next generation of really far out instruments that you're talking about where we can really learn more about it by some like really futuristic observational um, platforms and concepts. And I think that one of the key things is with science is when you make a discovery, it the questions blossom out from that. So it's really hard to predict now what would be next. But every major scientific discovery has led to many more questions and detailed observations. Don's going to want to put a rover on it. Yeah. <laughs> no. Yeah. Actually, you know, an analogy to Don's point for happening right now and presently is, is uh, efforts to look at, at microbiology down in the subsurface of the Earth. Mm -hmm. You get away from the, the surface of the Earth yeah. We think we understand how life works. We got it. There's light. There's photosynthesis. You know, there's there's you know organic matter, and then that's being consumed by somebody else. And, you know, we, we we have this comfortable understanding of of how microbes work, and now all of a sudden we we, we start to look at microbes that are extending down, you know, uh, good evidence to a kilometer, and and perhaps you know actually several kilometers when you consider gold mines. So um, so we have a biosphere that's now you know several kilometers into this into into the earth and, and the, the rules are very different in terms of how the microbes operate, how much energy they need to actually duplicate. It, it's it's really wild and so that's a good analogy of when you have a very very different biosphere, um, you start to learn about uh, learn rules that you didn't realize you you should have uh, you you learn questions you didn't know you had. It's a good point. I mean, I've heard it said this week that, that the ancient Earth is an exoplanet. Maybe you're saying that the, the deep Earth right. subsurface is also an exoplanet in a certain right. sense. Lindsay, do you, is there another question I you want to take? I think we have another question in the audience here. Yeah, my question is, if you had this dream telescope and you were able to turn it around and point it at Earth, how far back could you go in Earth's history and say, aha, we've got life there? And if you go back even farther to an, an Earth that you couldn't say, could you say, OK, not yet, but if we wait a billion years, maybe? Uh, so could, could we see the potential for life on a planet that, that doesn't yet have life, but we can say that, one, that one's promising? Yeah, and how far back in the Earth's history? I mean, so, so what kind of a shot in the dark are we looking at here? With, even if we were looking at Earth, where we know it's full of life, it's everywhere, you can't even get rid of it. How far back in history could we go on this planet and see it even with your dream telescope? That's a great question. Any, any thoughts? I'll start with just a, a, an oxygen-centric response. Um, <laughs> we got they, somebody speaking up for well, oxygen here. Well, <laughs> um, it's, it's a good thing to look for. Um, and, and if we look at Earth history, um, again, there are many people that think that the production of oxygen may have gone back three billion years ago. Um, but there are some, some very sophisticated analytical techniques that we can pull out of the rock record that suggest that it may not have accumulated in any preachable amounts until about 2.3 billion years ago. And so if you just want to take the perspective of oxygen, perhaps you could, you could go back 2.3 billion years ago and point your tel telescope and see that. And maybe you want to speak to other gases. So, well, so other gases would be possible in the Archean. But the, the other thing, we were talking about this a little bit earlier, and you alluded to, you alluded to it, I think, very briefly. Right. It's possible that for this boring billion we talked about, that oxygen levels were a little bit lower, but methane was a little bit higher. Yeah. And it may be because th that the combination of those two is actually easier to detect for you know, a billion or two billion years of Earth's history than those gases together are, are to detect now. In other words, there may have been times in Earth's history where the biosphere was more detectable than it is today, even when we think of our biosphere as sort of being the most verdant of all time. Uh, that's a very good point. If you accept that methane is, is a good biosignature, and in many cases it is, there's a, a popular notion that the early sun was, was fainter than it is today. 
And we're, we're stressed with this idea of how you maintain liquid water on the Earth's surface going back more than four billion years. And most people acknowledge that that's probably some combination of greenhouse gases. Yeah. And so carbon dioxide, methane, perhaps hazes that derive photochemically from methane. The, and the pale orange dot. Right. <laughs> and this hazy orange planet. That's right. So the, the pale blue dot. An, another, you know, uh, another just um, part of that answer, too, is just how, you know, irrespective of your technology, if you, if, you, if, if you looked at the ancient Earth, when would you see the biosphere being as completely dominant as it is today? And, uh, and really, you know, given how difficult or how, um, the, the, how rare rocks become that are that old, uh, it's really kind of amazing that you find evidence for life in, in all of the, the best preserved rocks that are quite old. And so if, you, if, you, if we have the technology to see life because of the methane it produces, even in the absence of an anoxic atmosphere, or in, in, in the absence of an oxic atmosphere, um, then, then it's, it's a large portion of the Earth's history that, that microbes really make a big effect on the planet. The early, earliest period might be hard. How long has Earth been a pale blue dot? Oh, that de well, that Roughly. depends. Roughly. <laughs> 4.2, 4.3 well, million. Yeah, four, yeah, yeah. Well, it, you know, if, if the, some people are saying that the pressure wasn't as high uh, on earlier. If, if that was yeah. the case, the, the Earth would have been less blue. So I would say at least two and a half years, maybe up to four. Two and a half. Billion. 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 Uh, with maybe some sporadic orange in there, <laughs> and some sporadic yeah, white, because we had these yeah, yeah. we had these uh, uh, snowball, snowball Earth events too. Right. Right. Even so, a pale white dot. So Carl Wasn't Sagan was blue. was right at least for the last couple billion years that it is a pale yeah. dot. Yeah, right. uh, we'll we'll give him that. Yeah. I think we have another question in the audience here. So it's clear that Earth is our gold standard for habitability for obvious reasons. However, if we're interested in the habitability of exoplanets, is this entirely fair? If you could turn the dials and adjust for the optimally habitable planet, knowing what you know about the current Earth and the early Earth, would it be different than Earth as we see it or Earth in the past? Great question. How, how would you make a, a, a more habitable planet? This, this, <laughs> more this, more really, habitable than Earth? this really gets at how uh, you can actually, to me, do, ask the scientific questions. So we, we only have one example of life. And um, for the complex life, we need a high energy source, which is the molecular oxygen. But for a lot of Earth history, before two and a half billion years or so, um, we had life that was using other energy sources. And some of it could have been, uh, was sunlight um, that may have produced some oxygen, but there are other ways to, to collect that. So I think it really depends on, on what type of biosphere you consider yeah. being most successful. So if you need large organisms, we need a very intense energy source. And um, that for plants is light, but for, for us, it, it, we need this chemical disequilibrium. And so our current Earth creates a really good model which we can use. And then when you start talking about other things that you might dial, you have to start making so many assumptions that it's really hard to say anything would be better. Hey, that's right. I mean, the Earth is an extraordinary place. Our distance from the sun, or the combination of gases, something that we haven't mentioned is the fact that our accretionary history, we were dealt a good hand in terms of radioactive materials and the heat that was generated within the Earth, which ultimately led to plate tectonics, the movement of plates on the Earth's surface. And that's a central thing and perhaps tipping points that led to more complexity, but in sustaining life because of the nutrients. Um, without that, it's, for example, hard to maintain a phosphorus balance, which is critical to life as we know it on Earth. And so it's a, it's a wonderful combination. The question is whether that same combination has to play out everywhere. And but I would here, say here's a for instance, just to, just to uh, push on, on your question a bit more. There is this question that came up earlier of why it took so long for complex life to arise on Earth. And um, there's been some discussion this, this week of the rise of oxygen and whether that's related. And obviously, it wasn't in, in a totally simplistic way. But there is this idea that it took a while for oxygen to build up, and we needed that energetic um, source to power animal life. Could you imagine a planet somewhat like Earth, but with different chemistry so that it didn't 
take as long for oxygen to build up so that there wasn't, I mean, people talk about all this iron that the oxygen had to react to. What if, um, I don't want to use the word reducing, a less reducing planet. What if, what if there was less stuff that the oxygen had to react with yeah, yeah. before it could build up so you had a planet where um, was chemically designed, you know, chemically primed for oxygen to build up earlier? Might you have gotten uh, an earlier start to complex life and by now we'd already be inhabiting other galaxies. <laughs> I think, I think though, uh, you know, we're, we're good, we're very good at figuring out what we'd miss. We'd certainly miss plate tectonics. Another thing, you know, that your, your point um, uh, sort of brings up is if you did that, there would be a longer term consequence because you do still continue to lose hydrogen and oxidize over long periods yes. of time. Right. So if you move that event up, yeah. you actually, at some level, shorten, shorten the habitability someday in the future, not knowing exactly when that is. Um, which also brings up another point. If you want to kind of find an optimal for a lifetime, smaller stars last longer. But now we're talking about billions and billions of years uh, into the future, and so, and so it's I'm all, I'm science fiction at that point. Did you need to I actually off? wanted to add, this, this actually ties in very well to a question that we have on social media, which is, if we find life very unlike our own, how would we be able to tell? Ah. Yeah, this, this gets at what you're how you actually recognize something right. as mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. And it gets back to the, the definition of what life is. And um, you know, we usually think of it as having a metabolism and inheritance and uh, reproduction. And we could easily, it, it is very conceivable to me that there could be a life that's very different than, on er than that on Earth. And we wouldn't recognize it because we don't have the right models for identifying those characteristics. So in some sense, we could end up with a false negative if mm -hmm. the life is so different, it doesn't actually fit with our model for how we detect life. But you and Sean both mentioned the notion of equilibrium and disequilibrium. Yeah. Sean's example of the, the, the grad students and the, and the pizza, and obviously right. something's going on if they're, if they're mixed together. What's, there's something, just, something must have just arrived. Um, so would you, think it would be reasonable to say that any kind of life will at least be doing something chemically to its environment, it'll be eating something, excreting something, and therefore it will leave some kind of a signature maybe in sort of the equilibrium mix of gases? Or is even that too much of an assumption? Well, the thing is that abiotic processes can give you a similar disequilibrium mm -hmm. or equilibrium depending sure. on the kinetics and the processes. And so I think it's, it's one of those, uh, it's one of those critical questions that I think, as a scientist, I, I want to model to compare and test things against, but I also want to keep in mind that my models are limited and restricted, and I don't know all these other things. But, but I would follow optimistically that we have chemical principles, and we hope that those are universal um, throughout the universe. And, and so this sense of disequilibrium, life today, is about the flow of electrons in, in amongst bacteria, simple single-celled organisms. And so if you had a sense for the chemistry on that planet that you're inferring from an atmosphere, you could start to envision reactions that could lead to that chemistry that could be a source of energy. And, and I think that's why studying the early Earth is so important, is because that's what we're doing on our own planet. We have a, a, a test right here. Mm -hmm. We can go back. We know life evolved. Right. And we can look at the chemistry on the early Earth, and we can see how it's changed from equilibrium over time. And we know it was around at a time when the planet was really different. That's where right. this whole like right. alien mm -hmm. Earths thing comes from, right? It's it, you know, if we want to look for the really weird stuff, we should start with the weird stuff that we actually have data on, yeah. which are these earlier versions of Earth. And and by looking at those alien versions of Earth, we can derive these these principles and test them, and hopefully come up with this like this fundamental theory of biogeochemistry that we can then apply elsewhere. Right. And it will requ require a lot of observation of Absolutely. this other planet and trying to understand its history and its biogeochemical cycling before we could def definitively say that it was in disequilibrium because of life. So mm -hmm. Earth is giving us, a, uh, ancient Earths are giving us a chance to practice for, ex and for yes. exoplanets. And the yeah. goes back <laughs> is that we had water through all of that. Right. right. I like yeah. that answer. It goes back to something that Dawn said earlier where you know, she was talk we're talking about the evidence of life at 3.5 that the reason that we get all comfortable with it is that we see, we see so many different components of it. And so that could be true of an exoplanet. Even if yeah. the life is completely different than life on Earth, 
that you might actually see evidence for an ecosystem yeah. before mm -hmm. you've recognized any individual life form. Yeah, if yeah. you saw Great those point. gases at, at, at yeah. disequilibrium, you saw them changing on, on seasonal time scales, yeah, yeah. You know, that's where things start that. to get real, or yeah, and you right. calculate their lifetimes, mm -hmm. and they're not disappearing fast enough. That's where things start to get really We think of seasonal and variation in CO2 today, and yeah, how we exactly. tie that to respiration and photosynthesis. Yeah. And, the, and, and the, a co-variation of O2. Right. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. And, and the one planet we know of with life is, is flagrantly altered by life. It's not, the signs of life on Earth are not subtle. If you were an alien coming into our solar system and you look at Mars and go, ah, oh, some CO2, some other stuff. You look at Venus and you go, ah, oh, some CO2, some other stuff. And then you look at Earth and you'd go, whoa, <laughs> look at that. This, we got a live one here. And it may be that that's a characteristic of inhabited planets, that they're flagrantly altered by life, in which yeah. case our job might be Maybe it's not a so subtle. Yeah. Maybe yeah. it's not so subtle. Yeah. Well, and yeah. oh. I think we have one more question yeah. from the audience. How much of our history have we lost to plate tectonics, and how well have we put the story back together? And then also, how lucky are we to have indirect access to rocks on Mars that are pretty as ancient as the ones we have on Earth? Great question. Anybody uh, feel like? Um, well, we've lost we've lost too much to plate yeah. tectonics. Um, we've too much, lost a lot, and and there's a bias in that loss, That's right? right? And yeah. so studying other planets fill some of that gap. Our record for the first half a billion years is really sparse. And when I got started, there was nothing. Uh, but now we have grains that go more than grains, and even rocks that go beyond four billion years. Um, the seafloor is lost constantly because of plate tectonics through time. And one of the challenges that we're faced with is trying to reconstruct an ocean chemistry for which there's no seafloor beneath that recorded. And so we look at places like early continents where there were sediments deposited on them and on the margins of continents that are still preserved. And there are risks in all of that, uh, but it's the best that we have because we have a, an Earth that's constantly recycling. But your question is very good. We've and lost the, much of the record, and the further you go back, the less of it there is. The other part of your question, how lucky are we to be exploring Mars, the answer is very lucky. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe somebody has a more sophisticated answer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really great to be able to look at these old rocks. and. Um, so when I first got interested in Mars, a lot of it was, well, we have a chance to look at the early a stages of, of a planet yeah, yeah. and early stages of Earth. Yeah. Um, but then we also have this whole issue that it is a different planet. And it had, yeah. clearly has a very different evolutionary history. And so you're in this really interesting place where we can look at the rocks that the Curiosity is seeing, for example, and we can find evidence that rivers flowed based on grains that round, and we know how they round on Earth. And we can look at some of the mineral reactions and, and understand the water-rock interactions. But we don't know enough yet <laughs> to tie that back to early Earth. We don't know when those two planets started diverging in their evolution. But with the, the increased data and the comb combination of, of the, the chemical and image data from orbit with the data we're getting from rovers on the ground, is, is providing this whole new view of the, of the complexity of Mars as a planet. And, and we will be searching for evidence of life, and we will be trying to understand the, uh, the environments, we'll understand the geochemical evolution, and we don't know yet which parts of that are going to help us understand Earth. So another question? Uh, well, I just wanted to see if um, anybody had any last final comments that they wanted to make about uh, our understanding, uh, there was some interest in um, the different environments on, this, or on the early Earth that may be applicable to uh, the new observations of uh, marine plankton on the ISS. Does anybody <laughs> have any comments on that? One last quick. Phoebe, <laughs> do you want to take that? Or? Um, I think what you told me to say was it was toothpaste. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. So diet diatoms and toothpaste. Plankton toothpaste. Maybe. Maybe. Or diatoms. Yeah. I don't know. In this field, you know, there are often these sensationalist news stories that some of which turn out to be true, but when you sort of read on the web as we did today, they found plankton on the outside of the International Space Station. The proper response is to go, oh, really? Uh huh. <laughs> uh, and so we're, we've just learned about this and we're skeptical, but of course we're interested in hearing more. Yes, great. Well, um, if that's about it, I just wanted to say uh, thank you guys all for joining us tonight. If you'd like to learn more, you can visit the website astrobiology.nasa.gov and continue the conversation at hashtag AskNASA. <laughs>